And I might even go as far as to say, I think Alabama can beat every team in college football. I still think they can beat everybody. But they're not going to be able to beat the likes of Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, if they play the way they've played in the first half of some of these games. Hello and welcome to Always College Football. I'm Greg McElroy. We hope you guys are having a terrific day. It's been fun kind of picking up the pieces of what was a chaotic week eight of the college football season. Today is October 23rd. We hope you're enjoying the show wherever you're getting the show, whether it's on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Just take a quick second, subscribe to the podcast, and if you could, leave us a rating. It'd mean a lot to us. We really appreciate it. If you're on Apple Podcasts, if you'd like to re- write a review, that would mean a lot as well. And if you're on the ESPN YouTube channel, hit that thumbs up button right below, and you can also subscribe to the ESPN College Football channel. Alongside Mark Kubiak, Jack Foster, Jake Garcia, we are halfway through October, and things are really starting to shake out here in the college football world. This past weekend delivered some really impressive performances. We saw some teams get massive wins, like Ohio State, like Alabama. We saw some teams look a little bit flat, but somehow find a way to win. We've forgotten that the most important part of playing the game each and every week is to win. Yes, I like style points too, but survive in advance and a handful of teams had to do just that, like Texas, like Oklahoma, like Washington. There were some less than stellar performances, but either way, they found a way to get it done at the very end. So we'll break all those things down, telling you the 10 takeaways that we had from this past weekend, and we're gonna dive into the AP poll. Got a bone to pick with the AP poll, so let's not waste any time and get it started there with the AP poll in college football. Like we do every Monday, we kick it off with the AP poll reaction. I I wish really badly, and look, we live in a world of hot takes, and maybe our show is not necessarily always going to generate some ridiculous reaction. Why? Because I really want to be authentic, and I want to be true to the sport. Like I'm not going to come out like some clowns and say that Caleb Williams needs to shut it down, Okay. What I'm going to do is I want to cover the sport appropriately, and I feel like I try to remove bias. I try to remove all these things, and it's really, really fun to point at the AP poll and rip them on a week-to-week basis. It's really fun to do that. Unfortunately, (laughs) I can't do that because the AP poll is pretty dang good, and it makes me mad. It makes me very, very mad, but the AP is doing a really good job. I got to give them some credit. So we'll go through my top 10 in a minute. Just for the record, it looks drastically similar to the AP top 10, which is very unfortunate. I'd love to give you a bunch of hot takes. I just can't. It's just not me. Let's start with a couple things of note from the AP poll. Ohio State is still number three in the poll, but they are only 50 points behind Michigan, who's at number two. They were at 99 points last week. So that gap is narrowing between two and number three. Alabama's back in the top 10. They're at number nine. That was a five-week run where they were outside the top 10, and that five-week hiatus was the longest for the Crimson Tide since 2006 to 2008. That was 35 straight weeks in which they were outside the top 10. Penn State remains in the top 10 despite the loss. They are 72 points behind Alabama and 77 points ahead of Oregon State. Oregon State's up to 11. That is their highest ranking since October 21st of 2012. And Missouri is up to number 16, its highest ranking since finishing the 2014 season, ranked number 14 overall. The biggest loser from the weekend was North Carolina. They dropped seven spots to number 17, which was the biggest drop amongst any team currently in the top 25. Air Force is up to 19, their first appearance in the top 20 since 2002. And then Iowa, thank goodness, drops out of the rankings this week. They did not receive a single vote in the poll. Thank you, AP poll voters, for watching Iowa the last couple weeks because they're exactly where they belong, way outside the top 25. At number one, I would have the Michigan Wolverines. That's right. The only changeup that I might have between the AP poll and what we've seen currently from the rest of college football. I'm not penalizing Georgia for having the week off. They've been great, but Michigan's been completely dominant. And to see what they did this past week against Michigan State, a team that had you know kind of given them some fits in the past, 
it's just completely dominant on both sides of the ball. Georgia would be at two. Ohio State would be at number three. I would have Florida State at number four. I actually thought it was a really good win this past week. Duke impressed me in many ways. And Florida State found multiple ways to beat them, obviously offensively, getting it going in the second half. Special teams a factor in this one as well. Florida State's resume continues to look exceptionally good with the win against Florida State, even though the win against Clemson is not what it once was. Uh, win against LSU in the Clemson win, not what it once was. Washington, I'd have it five. I know it was a bad performance. I know it was ugly. It was sluggish. We'll explain that here in just a minute. Oklahoma, I would have at number six. Oklahoma also definitely a little bit slow out of the gate against UCF. We'll talk about that one as well. Oregon's at number seven. They are the number one, one loss team in America, in my eyes. Saw them in person this past weekend, thoroughly impressed with what they have Running the football, and I think defensively, while there are areas where they can address, that's a pretty good group from top to bottom. Cam Ward had to play out of his mind just to put 24 points on the board, whatever it ended up being, I think is what it was. Anyways, Texas would be at eight. The injury to Quinn Ewers is one that we will monitor moving forward. He's going to miss some time. It's just a matter of how much, but I will be curious to see how Malik Murphy, who had a great offseason, how he fits into the starting role for the Longhorns. Bama's at number nine. That's where I'd have him. I think it's appropriate. They have a pretty good resume. The win over Ole Miss looks a little bit better. And then, of course, with the bye week and LSU game looming here in two weeks, we'll learn all we need to know about the Tide here in the next couple weeks. And then finally, at number 10, I don't have Penn State. The AP does. Penn State's offense was anemic. I'll explain that again here in a minute. So I'm going to put Oregon State in there. But being number 10 is not a good thing. Not a good thing here on Always College Football. I'll explain it again here in just a bit. Have you ever dreamed of hitting the road in your very own customized Mercedes-Benz Sprinter? Follow college football all season long by hitting all the biggest games in college football's most celebrated stadiums. At ESPN, we dreamed that dream, and with the help of Mercedes-Benz, we made it happen. This year, our very own Jen Latta has teamed up with Mercedes-Benz designers to create a road-ready, fully functional, state-of-the-art podcast studio on wheels. The ride is pure Mercedes-Benz with all-wheel drive and the latest driver assistance, safety, and tech. The podcast studio must be seen and heard to be believed. A spacious and chill conversation space with mics, camera, and mixing board to capture the action. On board, Jen Latta will be interviewing some of the biggest names in college football. All points to Mercedes-Benz for always bringing some extra. Out back of the Sprinter, they're innovating. Pushing the science of the tailgate, complete with grill, cooler, TV monitors, and more. This is hashtag van life meets the fan life. To get an inside look to this one-of-a-kind, blow-your-mind collaboration came together, visit mbvans.com slash Sprinter Labs. The Mercedes-Benz ESPN College Football Podcast Sprinter coming soon to a game near you. Takeaway number one. I love this Florida State football team. They've trailed by as many as 10 against Duke. They were down 20-17 to 17 late in the third quarter, and then Riley Leonard got hurt. It, of course, changed the dynamic of the game. Florida State went on to score 21 unanswered, and... It was very, very impressive, to say the least. This was their largest win while trailing entering the fourth quarter in the last 20 seasons. And now the Seminoles have a 99% chance of reaching the ACC championship game. That's all done by analytics. I can't explain it, but that's what they said. So I'm going to go with it. Near lock that the Seminoles will be playing in early December in Charlotte against who we'll find out at some point. Let's start by discussing Jordan Travis, okay? It feels like Jordan Travis, first of all, he's been very outspoken about how he has had to navigate the mental hurdles of being a quarterback at this level of football. And I appreciate his humility. I appreciate how he's been open about that. And the expectations on the outside for Jordan Travis are remarkable, but the expectations on the inside for him to be as good as humanly possible are also significant. So it does feel like at times, at times, Jordan Travis definitely feels that pressure, right? It feels like he is just trying to do on occasion just a little too much. And it feels like he presses at times. But my goodness, man, when he's at his best, 
he is terrific. If you look at how he played down the stretch, man, it was really impressive. The first half had the pick six on the deflected pass. You had a drop ball. Just didn't look very sharp there early on, but you fast forward into the fourth quarter when they had to have it. That's when he went on an absolute take over the game type of approach. The last two significant drives, including a 96 yard drive to give Florida State the lead. He was nine of 11 for 90 yards and a score. He also added 68 yards on the ground in the touchdown as well. So when Jordan Travis, when the switch gets flipped for him, he takes it to another level. And I love that that's in there. I would love to see it maybe over the course of a game. There are still moments in which they ebb and flow at the quarterback spot. Man, when he's on, he's on. And I appreciate very much how he's been able to battle and kind of weather the storm, but found a way to get it done against what I think is a really good defense for Duke. That's a solid group from top to bottom. They're very well coached. Their scheme is difficult. They do a lot of disguises and they make life difficult on the opposing quarterback. He hung in there, he battled, and then even though things didn't go his way early, it would have been easy for things to spiral out of control. It was completely the opposite. He got better as the game went along, and when they had to have him, he was at his very best. The defense, on the other hand, they have now pitched three consecutive second-half shutouts on the defensive side. Three games in a row that the opposing offense has yet to score on Adam Fuller's Florida State defense. It's been a month since the team scored against this defense in the second half. They're currently fourth nationally in points per drive allowed in the second half of games. So whatever tweaks Adam Fuller's using, whatever adjustments he's doing, it's paying significant dividends. Now, offensively, defensively, it's all it's all complimentary, right? I mean, the defense, when they get a lead and the defense and those pass rushers can pin their ears back and start coming after the opposing quarterback, it sure makes life difficult on the opposing team when you got Jared Verse and Patrick Payton and everybody else knowing it's obvious throwing situations, knowing it's in come from behind situations. So it does help that the offense has gotten going as well to just apply more pressure. But the defense, man, after halftime has been stellar, at least in the last few weeks. Hopefully that can continue as the schedule gets a little bit more dicey down the stretch. And then the team overall. Collectively, we have seen Florida State's A game multiple times this year. The problem is we have seldom seen it for a 60-minute game. That was, again, the case this past weekend. But you see, for instance, the second half against LSU. And you see it in moments over the last few games. The most complete game they've played to date was certainly against Syracuse, but they have a suffocating defense. They have an offense that's, I think, getting more physical as the week goes along. And now they have a quarterback that's starting to get to the point in which he can potentially play his best ball down the stretch. Now, Mike Norvell discussed it a little bit after the game. They don't have to be perfect. Doesn't necessarily mean they need to be perfect every week, but... They are doing, I think, an adequate job of getting the most out of their players when they got to have it. And that is something that you can't necessarily always teach, but it is something they'll be able to lean on as they move forward throughout the regular season schedule. All right. They don't have to be perfect every day, every game, but do they have to be perfect on the season to make the playoffs with the other hits the ACC took this week? And if so, as a Seminole fan, who would be the one or two games? Which one are you concerned about more? Versus Miami or at Florida? Well, at Florida will be tricky, but I think they have more firepower than the Florida Gators right now. I think they'll be good against the run against the Florida Gators. Miami, to me, is still a very dangerous team. Very dangerous team. And when you look at the ACC as a whole, granted, yes, there were some hits taken this past weekend, but I think Duke's still universally respected. They're in the top 20. Louisville has just one loss, and granted, yeah, the loss against Pitt is one that is difficult to forget. They're still sitting there at 11-1 to with a win against Notre Dame. If they catch them in the ACC championship game, they'll be in a really good spot. And you look at what North Carolina has down the stretch. North Carolina does have a tricky schedule down the stretch. They got Duke. They have to go to Clemson. They have to go to NC State. But North Carolina, even though, and we'll talk about it in a minute, even though things didn't go their way last week, I can forgive one bad performance on the season. It's difficult that that one performance came against who it came against, but... 
if they're sitting there, Florida State at 11 to 1, 12 and 1 as winners of the ACC, I have a very difficult time anticipating them being left out of the college football playoff. I do. I, I think they're going to be in. Uh, just given how the team has played, some of the wins, maybe the LSU game gets better. That could become a marquee win for them in time. They've, obviously, some of the wins they've already mounted to this point. So it's not their fault that Clemson didn't hold up their end of the bargain, but I'm looking more and more at the kind of the slate right now across college football. I have a difficult time thinking there's two teams from one league that are going to get in the playoff. I think you're going to have four different conference championships in the college football playoff quartet. I think Florida State, if they continue to play the way they play, has a very strong possibility of being one of them. Takeaway number two, if Alabama could put 60 minutes together, they would be ridiculously dangerous. Now, slow starts for the Crimson Tide have kind of become the norm, kind of starting to get used to it, to be honest with you. This past Saturday against Tennessee, that is their fourth consecutive game in which their opening offensive drive resulted in a three and out. So far, so far, if you take out the Middle Tennessee game, and take Middle Tennessee out for a moment because that's just they're just not a good football team. So you just got to remove them. And that's not an indicator of where the tide is currently at offensively, at least early in the game. If you remove that game, Alabama is currently averaging less than two points in the first quarter of their games. 1.8 to be exact. The first three offensive drives this past weekend totaled 10 plays for 30 yards and a turnover. Obviously, that was the fumble that led to the field goal that ultimately gave Tennessee the 10 nothing lead. Okay, now the deficit got cut on the 10-yard touchdown from Milrow to Burton, but that was really the only bright spot there in the first half of the football game for the Tide. Seven possessions resulting in one score, three punts, two turnovers, and a really, really ugly 13-point halftime deficit. But... Alabama now for how many times this year? How many times this year have we looked at Alabama in the first half? And I know I saw my Twitter. I was on the call of Oregon and Washington State, and I had people tweeting at me talking about how inept Alabama looked in the first half of the football game. And I didn't respond because I'm in the midst of working on my own game. But I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I'm like, just hang in there. Because for whatever reason, whether it's against Texas A&M, where they had to rally in the second half against Ole Miss, where they had to rally in the second half against Tennessee this past week, rally in the second half. There have been so many different occasions in which they looked great in the final 30 minutes. Now, there are also a couple of games, for instance, the fourth quarter performance against Texas, the second half performance against Arkansas, where it just felt like they kind of exhaled and took their foot off the gas a little bit. But they've found a way to figure it out in the second half. I mean, they're down 20 to 7 at halftime, the third quarter, 29 yard play to Jace McClellan. Then you get the 46 yard touchdown to Isaiah Bond. And two plays, touchdown. And next thing you know, you're starting to create a little bit of a snowball effect on the Tennessee Volunteers. Well, the defense, they get even better in the second half. For whatever reason, you get a guy pinned down their own inside their own 10. You go th force a three and out. They obviously decide a little later in the game to go for it on fourth and one. Alabama gets the stop. And then ultimately, that was all she wrote. So this defense has played much better. They, of course, got the strip sack, too, and the scoop and score to kind of put the game on ice and a second half shutout. Well, everybody kind of starts to focus on what's going on offensively and why. Tommy Reese and company can't quite get things going on that side of the ball early on. The defense is still playing to a championship caliber. It's just they got to figure out a way to start the way they've finished on multiple occasions this year. I've said it all along. I've continued to harp on the fact that Alabama can beat every team on their schedule. And I might even go as far as to say, I think Alabama can beat every team in college football. I still think they can beat everybody. But they're not going to be able to beat the likes of Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State if they play the way they've played in the first half of some of these games. If they play the way they've played in the second half against AM, Ole Miss, Tennessee, they can beat anyone. So a 60 minute performance is looming. Alabama now heads into the bye week, and I think it's going to be a good opportunity for them to catch their breath to assess all right, here's how we're starting the game. 
here's the script offensively that we're starting the game with. I think Tommy Reese needs to sit down with Jalen Milrow and said, all right, what are you comfortable with? Tell me what you're most comfortable with and we'll make sure that we use those parts of the plan earlier in the game. Because I think if this team could figure out a way to start fast, it could be very scary moving forward. And I think the bye week could not come at a better time for the Crimson Tide. They're trending up for sure, but naturally a very difficult test against what is a high-powered outlet in LSU that looms there on the first Saturday of November. If they put 60 minutes together against LSU, do you think Alabama could put 60 minutes together in three straight games against Georgia and then in a playoff and then for the national championship? Well, let's let's not get too far ahead of ourselves here. Well, you just said they could beat anybody. I was like, they okay. Can. I mean, I they believe can. they can, but do you think they can yeah. put it all together in that stretch? One would hope. I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I'd, I'd love to tell you yes, but I don't know that for sure. I mean, I think... Teams that are herky-jerky, and the reason why I started with uh, Florida State and Alabama, because there are some similarities between the two. When they flip the switch, they're unbeatable, or they at least appear unbeatable. But when they're playing poorly, they're extremely beatable by anyone. I mean, the ups and downs are pretty remarkable. I mean, the fact that Boston College, I know Boston College isn't bad, but Boston College had Florida State on the ropes at one point. It was almost unthinkable that Florida State could lose to Boston College with how they'd played up to that point of the season. There's also unthinkable to think that Bama looked as hapless as they did against South Florida. But when they flip the switch, man, they're a completely different team. It's just if that switch could flip in the first quarter for some of these teams and they can go the distance, it'd be really, really scary. But man, the ups and downs are a little tricky. And and that's something that I think Nick Saban's trying to manage. Mike Norvell at Florida State's trying to manage. I think all teams are trying to put together 60 minutes naturally, but man, it seems like it's harder for some teams than it is for others. Let's go to takeaway number three. Tennessee's road woes continue. And at some point, they're going to have to figure this out. Uh, I, now, Joe Milton, we'll start with him. First half, I mean, he was the guy that we thought Joe Milton might be coming into the season. I mean, he was running the ball. He was being decisive. He was getting downhill. He was running through guys, making guys miss. He showed touch downfield. He wasn't wasn't perfect in the first 30 minutes. But I don't think anybody at this point expects Joe Milton to be perfect. But for you to look at the halftime line of 16 to 22, 175, you think that's pretty dang good, especially what he did just a week earlier against Texas A&M. I mean... He did not look comfortable at all against Texas A&M, but against Alabama in the first 30 minutes, a couple touchdowns, uh, obviously had 43 rushing yards on eight attempts there in the first half. But then in the second half, Bama adjusted a little bit with how they played defensively. They changed their front along the defensive line, and it was almost just a completely different looking Tennessee offense there in the second half of the football game. That's now multiple times. Now, in hostile environments this year where the Vols have not played good football, three extremely bad halves of football, obviously losing to Florida the way they did, and then the second half against Alabama, they couldn't do anything right. Now, they're still in a great position to get to a high-level bowl game, but guess what? There's a couple of road trips looming that need to be of concern for Tennessee fans because for whatever reason, they can't put it all together on the road. I don't know why that is. I can't explain it. Maybe it's the way they run their offense. Maybe it's the nonverbal communication. But for whatever reason, when things start to get away from them, they get away from them in a hurry. And that's not going to be very good when you have to go to Kentucky this week and then a road trip to Missouri a little later in the season. Now, here's the sequence that really flipped things for Tennessee. Now, Tennessee, of course, had the fair catch confusion on the kickoff. Bama then forced the three and out, got the ball back immediately. Bama goes right down the field, kicks the 42-yard Will Reichert field goal. Then the lead was cut to 20-17. to Well, the next drive, you get the fourth and one in which Jihad Campbell stops the running back. I believe it was Sampson there. And now Bama has the ball in Tennessee territory. McClellan, just a couple plays later, takes 
touchdown. Now Alabama's got the lead 24 to 20, a lead that they would never relinquish. Now, the fourth and one call is the one that I'm going to highlight, at least for the moment. I don't have a problem going forward on fourth and one at your own 47. I don't, however, like the fact that they handed the ball to Dylan Sampson. I don't. Here's what I would do. Now, hey, hindsight's 2020. Okay. Hindsight is 2020. They had multiple fourth and short failures. Explain to me this. What have we learned from watching the Philadelphia Eagles the last couple of years? What play is unstoppable? That'd be quarterback sneak with offensive players pushing the quarterback. Your quarterback's six foot five, 240 pounds. They need to think strong, strong, strongly about giving the ball in a quarterback sneak situation in a fourth and short, third and short situation. They need to get the tush push play installed because nobody can found a way to stop that yet. Especially when you have a strong, physically capable quarterback. So that is one that I think they would love to have back. But man, for whatever reason, Tennessee's got to get things figured out on the road because if they don't, they might find themselves here as we fast forward down the stretch of the season looking at an eight and four because a road trip to Kentucky and a road trip to Missouri, those aren't likely to be victorious if they don't play better on the road. And also, let's take it one step further. You got Georgia coming to your place where you've played well, but we know Georgia is by far their most difficult game remaining on the schedule. Takeaway number four, you're allowed to have a bad day in college football. You're allowed to have a bad day, but some days are definitely worse than others. Now, a lot of people are going to just crush Washington and and crush Texas and, and crush Oklahoma, but these teams all won the game. They all won the game. Now, was it was it fun to watch? Was it easy to watch? Absolutely not. Let's start with Washington since they're ranked number five, favored by four touchdowns. You escape 15 to seven in a win against Arizona State. I told you this game was going to be close. I told you it was going to be dicey and that Arizona State was 14 and one against the spread in the last 15 games against Washington. A lot of people are like, why don't you just tell us our, your picks against the spread? I tell you the trends. And if you listen to the trends, you're probably capable enough to figure out which way I would lean against the spread. And this one was very, very clear. If not for the Mishael Powell 89-yard pick six in the fourth quarter, then this was probably going to be a game that might have resulted in a loss. But Washington found a way. Michael Penix did not have his best stuff. A couple picks, a couple fumbles, three total turnovers after having just three the entire season entering Saturday. So They got to figure some things out, but they found a way to win and they had like their D minus game in the process. So, hey, take it and run. But it was ugly. No doubt about it. How about the post Red River rivalry hangover for both Texas and Oklahoma? Yeah, Dylan Gabriel, three touchdowns against his former team, but it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty whatsoever. And Oklahoma's defense stepped up when it mattered most to stop that two point conversion. I don't understand what kind of call that was. For UCF, sometimes I think you get a little too cute, even though they've run the offense and they ran the ball with a lot of efficiency this past week. But for whatever reason, they decided to do that, decided to get a little tricky, and it and it certainly was not a good play whatsoever. But Oklahoma trailed more on Saturday for 21 minutes and nine seconds than it had in the first six games of the season combined. They had only trailed for 12 minutes and 11 seconds. That was the fewest time trailing among all FBS teams entering the day. So they didn't play their best stuff, but they survived. Texas also looked a little lethargic there in the second half of the football game. They charge out. I actually changed the channel because it looked like they were going to run away with this thing against Houston. Up 21 nothing in the second quarter. They found themselves tied 24 all late in the fourth. Now, C.J. Baxter obviously had the touchdown with five minutes left, and that was the ultimate difference. But Quinn Ewers, a couple touchdowns, no interception, but he got banged up. So that's something to keep an eye on for sure. But Texas goes on the road, could have been a flat spot. They found a way to win. I was very surprised by that performance, to say the least. And then finally, those three teams won. North Carolina did not. Now, 24-point home favorite, and you lose a game to... 
a Virginia team that did not look very good all season long. They had been completely hapless. And it obviously impacts North Carolina's possibility of getting to the college football playoff. But you think about where Virginia was. The only team they'd beaten this year was William and Mary. And that game, by the way, was tied throughout the first half. It's pretty wild to think that they pulled off the second biggest point spread upset in the ACC in the past 30 years. And that was the easiest game remaining on North Carolina's schedule. And that's a loss that could reverberate not just for their own playoff candidacy, but for everyone else's playoff candidacy as well. It was an inexcusable loss, and it's hard to even wrap your head around because it could have been worse. If not for the fumble out of the back of the ends and that resulted in a touchback for North Carolina, it could have been worse. But think about what North Carolina has left at Georgia Tech. Were they really looking ahead to Georgia Tech this past week? And that's why they came out flat and uninspired on both sides of the ball. Can't imagine. Obviously, Georgia Tech got them last week, last year. So, hey, this is not necessarily a slam dunk this week on the road at Georgia Tech. Then they get Campbell. That's a lock. You got Duke at home on November 11th. You go to Clemson on November 18th, and you go to NC State on November 25th. So they need to tighten up and tighten up quickly because that was an inexcusable performance from the Tar Heels after they looked so good in the first six or seven weeks of the season. Back to Texas for a second and the Quinn Ewers injury. The schedule doesn't look too daunting for what they have. BYU, K-State, at TCU, at Iowa State, and Texas Tech. But how concerned would you be if, a, if you were a Longhorn fan about running the rest of the table? Well, I mean, I'm really concerned. K-State's looking better. Uh, I think BYU's a tricky game. BYU's sitting there as a quiet 5-2. and two. I mean, I think things have gotten a lot more dicey. And depending on how long Quinn Ewer is going to be out, I don't know how good Malik Murphy is. I think he's pretty good. People swear by him. People said he had a great spring. People say he's really capable of taking the lead. If not, if in the event in which Ewers was unavailable, people said that he's got a ton of ability and might be just good, just good enough to be able to contribute in the run game and all these other aspects. But yeah, I'm real concerned if I'm Texas, especially knowing what happened last year when Quinn Ewers got hurt. Hey, college football fans, whether you're on the field or in the stands, make sure you're well protected, like having a solid defense to shut down that wide receiver in the final quarter, opening lanes for your running backs to do their thing, and of course, reliability when protecting your quarterback, because great coverage is a game changer. That's why Allstate provides that same protection off the field giving you reliable coverage and game-winning protection for everything that matters, helping you stay game day ready every day. So get protected with Allstate. Visit Allstate.com or call a local agent today to learn more. Brought to you by Allstate. You're in good hands. Insurance coverage is subject to terms, conditions, and availability. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates Northbrook, Illinois. Takeaway number five. Michigan right now is the most complete team in the country and J.J. McCarthy should be in the Heisman conversation. Now they have outscored their first eight opponents by an average of 35 points per game. And you can say, well, it's because they're, you know, it's a cakewalk in the non-conference. Well, all right, let's just use Big Ten play for an example. Their margins of victory are 24, 38, 42, 45, and 49, including a 49 nothing shutout against their rivals in East Lansing on Saturday night. That is the worst home loss in the history of Spartan Stadium. Now, I understand very much that a lot of people are already poking holes and, well, who's it against? Fair enough. Michigan's five Big Ten opponents are a combined 7 and 14 in league play. And their best win up to this point has come against Rutgers. Okay. But you have to look at the standard to which they're playing. It's not like they're messing around. I mean, how many teams did we just reference a second ago with Oklahoma, Texas, Washington, teams that are playing down to the level of the competition? We're not getting that from Michigan right now. Michigan is playing to their standard and as a result is flexing on every single team that they have a significant advantage against. 
And J.J. McCarthy, people are starting to take notice. J.J. McCarthy, now in Vegas, is the favorite to win the Heisman Trophy. He's now moved ahead of Michael Penix because Michael Penix had three turnovers this past weekend. Now, they've obviously had three Heisman winners in the past with Desmond Howard, Tom Harmon, and Charles Woodson, but no quarterback for Michigan has ever won the award. Here's the most mind-boggling stat of the bunch for Michigan so far. They have scored 325 points this year, and they've allowed just 47 points. They're the third team in the last 60 years to score 325 or more points and allow fewer than 50 through the first eight games of the season. They're the first team to do it since Florida State back in 1993. We all know what happened with Florida State back in 1993. What I'm also impressed with is that we know they have great running backs, right? That's been established. I don't think I need to convince anybody that just how good their running backs are and how much the offensive line has come together. I also think one of the biggest surprises this year has been how good the wide receivers have been. Those guys have been excellent. Well, guess what? Saturday taught us something else. They now have, I think, two real legitimate difference makers at tight end. And with how they've styled their offensive attack, having tight ends that can really put fear in the opposing defense is significant, man. I mean, Colston Loveland and A.J. Barner, they had yet to really been unleashed, right? They'd yet to really kind of be featured within the offense. Well, Saturday night they were. 12 catches, 178 yards, and three touchdowns. Now, here's one thing that I think is really different for Michigan this year is that they were a team that had to stay on schedule. They had a team they had to methodically work their way down the field in order for their offense to be successful. They couldn't get themselves in negative plays and overcome those negative plays. They needed to have on first and 10, they had to gain four or five to sit at second and five, gain two or three on third down, on second down to set up third and manageable, so on and so forth. They methodically worked their way down the field. That is not the case this year. If you got them behind the sticks, their drives were dead in the past. That's not the case this year, man. They can overcome very difficult down and distance. They can overcome penalties. They can overcome very difficult spots. And there were a bunch of examples this past weekend in which they overcame those spots. That's a crazy scary thing for opposing teams because even if you win on first down and you sack J.J. McCarthy to set up second and 18, it might not matter anymore. Here's a couple of examples of downs they overcame. They overcame a third and 14. They overcame a third and 13. They overcame a third and eight. And they overcame a second and 18. It's pretty wild. And you think they converted on all four of those long yardage off schedule situations and route to a 21 nothing lead before Michigan State finally got off the field on third down. I'm telling you, man, this Michigan team is the real deal. And I can't wait until the schedule strengthens because when it does, I think they'll finally start to get some of that universal respect as potentially the best team in college football. But nobody's going to say that right now because of just how bad some of the teams on their schedule have been up to this point of the season. Do you think Michigan can keep the focus? Like you hear the outside noise, you hear the NCAA investigation. It feels like it's Michigan against the world right now. You think they can keep the focus for the next four weeks? Yes. <laughs> this is right. a well, I mean, they haven't played anybody. All of a sudden, they have Maryland. It's a two-time defending Big Ten champ. Yes, they can keep the focus. Absolutely. I think this is a mature football team that can beat you in a lot of different ways. And I, I remain crazy optimistic about what this team's ceiling looks like. But we all know what's looming for Michigan. Games against both Penn State and against Ohio State. So let's talk about those opponents and what they did this past weekend because it was a tremendous, tremendous game between the two. Takeaway number six, Ohio State and Ryan Day, they have evolved. A lot of people are like, well, hang on, what does that mean? They have evolved. But at the same time, it's still players over plays. Saturday's game was very, very simple. 
There were two elite defenses on the field. But you know the biggest difference in Saturday's game? One team had Marvin Harrison and the other team did not. Now, if you look at Marvin Harrison, it wasn't even his best game. He had a couple drops in the first half, but there was never a doubt that when there was a play that needed to be made, it was going in the direction of Marvin Harrison. Every time. Now, you also take into account who he did it against. It's not like Penn State's chopped liver. Penn State entered the game with the nation's top-ranked pass defense. They gave up just 121 yards per game through the air coming into Saturday's game. Marvin Harrison exceeded that mark all by himself. He was tremendous in this game. But here's where Ryan Day has evolved. Last year and in previous years, it felt like Ryan Day, not saying he had tunnel vision by any stretch, but there was clearly something that he did, whether it's in how they scheduled their practice, whether it's in how they handled how they handled offseason, what they targeted in the portal, what they prioritized on the recruiting trail. There was clearly an, a heavier emphasis on creating opportunities offensively. And the defense, for whatever reason, it was kind of put on the back burner a little bit. Just a little bit. Not, not to the extent in which they, you know, didn't care about the defense, but they utilized tempo. They wanted to emphasize scoring points. They wanted to highlight their elite wide receiver play. They wanted to highlight their quarterback. That was totally understandable. They had great quarterbacks the last handful of years, and it's pretty amazing the receiver talent that they've had and the running back talent that they've had and the amount of points they could score. But they did so at the expense of their defense from time to time. Just one year removed against Michigan, Georgia, and Penn State, against those three teams, they gave up 118 combined points in those games. And their two ranked matchups this year, they've given up just 26 points. That's amazing. I mean, that is amazing. Now, you can say what you want. Well, what about, you know, is Notre Dame's offense any good? Is Penn State's offense any good? I think those are reasonable questions. I can live with that. But Penn State had six points in the game, not for the garbage time touchdown there at the very end. So I am thoroughly impressed with how Ryan Day has obviously won. He's enabled Jim Knowles to be who he is. And Jim Knowles is amazing, I might add. He's done a great job with his personnel and a great job with their structure and maybe not being quite as aggressive and just allowing the players to be the best players they can be by playing fast and sound without trying to dictate too much on that side of the ball. But Ryan Day has also, I think, helped his defense out with how he's managed his offense. And as a result, they're coming together in a really nice fashion. While it's not the track meets that we've seen traditionally from Ohio State, man, they know how to play complementary football. And here's the other thing about Ohio State. If you want to win a national championship, there's a couple things that you have to be able to do. Have to be able to do. You have to, one, be capable of weathering the storm and battling adversity. Because there's going to be a time throughout the course of the season where things don't go your way, or you give up a big play, or you make a big mistake. So let's point to last week's game. There were countless missed opportunities for Penn State. Okay, countless. Obviously, you have the holding penalty on Kalen King that wiped away the defensive touchdown for Curtis Jacobs. That would have been real easy for Ohio State to be a little bit rattled after that circumstance. They weren't. How about this? The fact that they had the punt late in the third quarter, bounces backwards, hits Lorenzo Styles, and now Penn State has a golden opportunity at midfield to be able to go and maybe take over the game at that point. Well, how about this? JT Tuimolao has the eight-yard sack and then they have a third and 15. It's pretty amazing to me that they were able to weather the storm there in a sudden change situation where it could have slipped away. It didn't. And that's a testament to the mental toughness of this Ohio State football team. So you got to be able to weather the storm and battle adversity. They showed that this past weekend. That's one major takeaway from the game. But here's takeaway number two. If you want to win a national championship, you better have really competitive depth. Ohio State was shorthanded in this game. Without Emeka Ibuka, you're without Travion Henderson, 
and you're without Denzel Burke. So they weren't at full strength whatsoever. But an example of the competitive depth being on display, Denzel Burke's out, no problem. Let's put in Jermaine Matthews. His first major extended playing time obviously was a highly recruited kid. I think he was a four-star prospect, five-star prospect, whatever he was, highly recruited kid. Well, he goes in the game, doesn't miss a beat, has three tackles, a pass breakup, and did not give up a single big play in the game. That is massive. Their competitive depth, even in the absence of some of their best players, was able to step up, fill the void, and as a result, they got a comfortable victory against the best team they've played so far this season. And then takeaway number seven. Penn State is perennially good, but I cannot at this point put them in the elite category. Let's start with James Franklin because it starts at the top. He's now 1-9 and nine against Ohio State. He's 0-12 in his head coaching career against AP top 10 opponents on the road, including 0-10 at Penn State. Penn State is now 3-16 and 16 against AP top 10's teams under Coach Franklin. And they haven't beaten a top 10 team on the road since 2008 at Ohio State. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, James Franklin's overrated. James Franklin's overrated. I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that line of thinking because it depends a little bit on where you rank James Franklin. Do you have him as a top five coach in college football? Do you have him as a top 10 coach in college football? Because for someone to be overrated, he has to be rated too highly. But I don't think anybody has James Franklin in that spot. But we found again that while he can recruit and the roster is good, they're not quite where they need to be just yet in some positions in particular. Let's start with the quarterback, Drew Aller. He wasn't the guy on Saturday, man. Like This was supposed to be the five-star guy that's going to go out there and create all these big plays. He's got a big arm, super accurate, Five-star dude. But if you look at his performance, he didn't play very well. Now, we'll get to the receivers in a minute. But he was off target on 17 of his 40 attempts. That's 42.5% of his targets were off target. Uncatchable, if you will. So he's got to be more accurate. And I think the The protection around him, because he did throw under duress multiple times. The protection around him has to be a little better as well, because one of our big question marks about Drew Aller was, would he be mobile enough if the pocket isn't great? That's what Sean Clifford did a great job of throughout the course of his career. Love him or hate him, he did extend plays. Drew Aller has not shown the ability to be able to do that just yet. And even from the pocket, there were some big misses in the game on Saturday. How about a wide receiver? The big question all throughout the offseason was, did they have a number one? Did they have the big playmaking ability? Thought Keandre Lambert-Smith could maybe be that guy. But answer me this, if you take Marvin Harrison and put him on Penn State, do they win the game on Saturday? I, I think it's a legitimate question. I think it's a possible question. And they've done a good job of developing quality wide receivers over the course of James Franklin's tenure. We think about Chris Godwin and Deshaun Hamilton and KJ Hamler and and Jahan Dotson, they've done a good job of, of developing players. But you think, well, I'm going to go to the portal and I'm going to bring in game changers. I'm going to bring in some transfers. I'm going to bring in Dante Cephas. I'm going to bring in Malik McLean. Well, those two have combined for just 15 catches. They have to find elite wide receiver play, whether it's in the portal or in a high school recruiting, because that is the position group right now that is most notably the biggest drop-off for Penn State when evaluating them up against Ohio State. They got the defense. They got the running backs. I think in some ways they have the offensive line, but the wide receiver group collectively is not where it needs to be. And that, like we'll talk about on Wednesday's show, is a premier position currently in college football. The biggest issue for Penn State in this game was on third down. When you go one for 16 on third down, the lone conversion coming on the last drive of the game, 6% third down conversion rate is the worst by any AP ranked team in the game over the last 10 seasons with at least 15 third down attempts. But if you chart how those third downs actually failed, five 
of their 16 third down attempts were throws that were off the mark. They had two drops. They had two really well defended passes. So that means the receivers weren't able to create enough separation and they got hit at or behind the line of scrimmage multiple times. That's two times. So that's 11 of their 16 third downs off target five drops two, passes well defended two, and rushes hit at or behind the line of scrimmage two. They failed to move the chains all the way up until the face mask penalty, obviously. That was with four minutes to play, and at that point, it was all she wrote. Now, the defense was up to the task. Ohio State couldn't run the ball, just 41 attempts for 79 yards. They made Kyle McCord at times look uncomfortable. Uh, obviously, I think the pass rushers made their presence felt. But Marvin Harrison... They didn't have an answer for him. But everybody on the Buckeye team was creating separation. Everybody. According to some next level analytics, they were wide open or open. I don't know how you qualify one or the other. To me, it's binary. You're either open or you're not open. But they were either wide open or open on 23 of the 35 pass attempts for Kyle McCord. That's 66% of the pass attempts where the receiver that they were going to was open. So they did not do a good job in the back end. I know Marvin Harrison's a difficult one to keep up with, but at the same time, the defense, if there was one issue, it was certainly in the back end against a quality passing attack that Ohio State had at their disposal. Mmm, you smell that? That's the scent of fresh turf and freshly cracked Dr. Pepper which can only mean one thing. It's college football season. So block off your Saturdays and swipe a sweet Dr. Pepper from the mini fridge because there's a new season of high kicks, long throws, and Fansville commercial breaks to carry you all the way to the West Coast games. That's right, the fans are back and this year things are heating up. We're talking about hot takes, more heartbreak, more layers of face paint, Get ready to drink in all the drama this season with the help of the most delicious college football tradition there is, Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. Takeaway number eight. We're about to find out what USC and Lincoln Riley are all about. Now, of course, they came up short this past weekend against Utah. Utah's now won four in a row against USC. That's the second most consecutive wins against USC by a Pac-12 school in the AP poll era. And when you look at where things were, okay, the final drive, because this was pretty wild. I mean, I understand that it was an unfortunate rough in the passer call. I get that. I understand that there was that great scramble there by Bryson Barnes after the pass rush lost contained, but that was a frequent problem throughout. The reality is that we're going to find out over the next month and a half what USC is all about. It's either going to be an amazing story of redemption or they're going to come crashing down and implode upon themselves like a dying star. And I really hope, really hope it's the story of redemption because Lincoln Riley and company, they've never really been in the spot. Obviously at SC, they were a game away from getting to the college football playoff last year. It was really remarkable to see just how quickly he had flipped that thing around to where they were playing high level football. But this is really the first time where before the calendar flips to November, they don't have a lot that feels like they still need to play for. Now, getting to the Pac-12 title game, still very much a possibility. That can absolutely happen. But you think back to his time at Oklahoma. He stepped into a program with a great established culture that Bob Stoops, his predecessor, had kind of set up. They had a DNA that they expected to win. They won conference championships before him. They won a ton of conference championships after him. Thought maybe he'd be able to go to SC and just flip the script and just things would be just right as rain. This guy's a game changer, a game tra changer. But now he's going to have to do something that he's probably never had to do before. He's going to have to look internally and figure out how do I build this thing into a consistent winner? Now, I think it's real easy to look at USC and say, man, they're one of the biggest disappointments of the college football season so far. I won't push back on that. They have been disappointing because some of the progress that you'd hope they would have made 
just hasn't necessarily materialized. But I think some of the expectations coming into this year were a bit aggressive. Now, they can still win the conference. They're 6-2, and 4-1 and one in the Pac-12. But they have clearly, in some ways, taken a step back from last year. A defense that probably wasn't going to be able to rely on 20-plus turnovers. They've had a significant regression in that department. The schedule is much more difficult this year as well. But don't sleep on USC down the stretch. They still have one of the game's most talented players in Caleb Williams. They still have quality personnel. Yeah, they lost to a team that's had their number. There's there's no denying that. They've lost two in a row. So everyone's saying that, you know, it's over for Lincoln Riley. But he does need to look in the mirror and evaluate how do I adjust so that my team can win games in a multitude of different ways. Because if the offense isn't clicking on all cylinders, they're probably not going to win. We just talked a moment ago about how Ohio State has won games this year. Want to know why? Because Ryan Day has adjusted. And it doesn't have to be a track meet where the offense is high-powered and scoring 40-plus to win the game. Sometimes you have to have more than just a fastball. And right now, USC doesn't have that. So hopefully, Lincoln Riley will adjust and adapt and will learn a lot about the culture of this team moving forward. But they're at a crossroads, and they need to make some adjustments quickly if they want to contend for championships down the road. Takeaway number nine. Sometimes offense can be offensive. Now, entering Saturday, no FBS team had won a game this season in which it failed to score an offensive touchdown. They were 0-47 in those games. You heard that right. No FBS team had won a game this year in which they failed to score an offensive touchdown. 0-47. Well, that all changed on Saturday. Three teams won games on Saturday that failed to score an offensive touchdown. That's the most of any day in the last 20 seasons. Let's start with Minnesota. They defeated Iowa. Iowa, obviously, they won the game and then they lost the game in the most insane way possible. Looked like the Cooper DeJean punt return touchdown with a buck 21 remaining. Looked like they were going to somehow find a way, but obviously they had the fair catch, no fair catch thing, whatever it was, invalid fair catch. They almost escaped. They almost escaped. But... 127 yards of offense, and yet you still almost had a chance to win the game. Obviously, it was a controversial ending. And Minnesota, now sitting at 4-3, and three, that's their first victory over Iowa in Iowa City since 1999. But Nevada defeated San Diego State 6-0. Nevada won a college football game for the first time in 413 days on Saturday. The Wolfpack went to San Diego State as an 11-point dog and snacked a 16 16- Game losing streak with a 6 nothing victory. They hadn't won a game since a home win against Texas State on September 3rd of 2022. And then Washington obviously beat Arizona State. Washington almost, almost lost this game. And if not for the Mishael interception return, they would have obviously come up a little bit short. So... Just because teams didn't score offensive touchdowns this week doesn't mean they weren't victorious because I just gave you three examples in which it wasn't pretty whatsoever, but they somehow found a way. You also had the Mississippi State 7-3 win against Arkansas, which was the first conference win for the Bulldogs this season. The seven points scored by the Bulldogs are the fewest in a win by an SEC game since Auburn beat Mississippi State 3-2 in 2008. And then finally, one of the craziest takeaways of this past weekend is that it's not over until it's over. There were 15 fourth quarter comebacks on Saturday. That's tied for the third most on a single day in the last 20 years and the most on a single day this season. Now, we've already documented Florida State in their rally against Duke. We already talked about Oklahoma and the scare they survived against UCF. We've talked a couple times about how Washington rallied from four down to beat Arizona State. And then we, of course, talked about Utah and their game-winning field goal against SC. 
but there were a bunch of others in which teams erased a fourth quarter deficit en route to a victory. Miami scored 10 unanswered points in the fourth quarter to force overtime against Clemson, and they secured the victory in the second overtime when they scored on the A.J. Allen touchdown, and then they got Cade Klubnick for an eight-yard loss on the fourth and goal situation on the one-yard line. So that was significant. Dabo was very unhappy with the decision by Cade Klubnick after the fact. He talked about it in his post-game press conference, but Miami, 10 unanswered to force overtime. What a win for Mario Cristobal, his first ACC win at home as the head coach of the Hurricanes. Boston College trailed by, trailed by six at the start of the fourth quarter and outscored Georgia Tech 21 zip en route to a 38-23 victory. Oklahoma State outscored West Virginia 28-10 to in the fourth quarter en route to a 48-34 victory. Ollie Gordon, man. Ollie Gordon is starting to figure things out. And Oklahoma State, that battle of Bedlam is starting to look really interesting here in a couple weeks. He's the fourth player in program history to rush for at least 250 yards and four touchdowns in a game. He joins Kendall Hunter, Barry Sanders, and Thurman Thomas. I'd say that's pretty good company to be aligned with. How about Wisconsin? Down 21-7 entering the fourth quarter, outscored Illinois 18-0 in the fourth to survive and win 25-21. The 14-point comeback matches the largest fourth quarter comeback since 1990 for the Badgers. And Braylon Allen, of course, had another great day. 19th time he's gone over 100. That's the most in the FBS since 2021. And the Badgers are 17-2 in that game. Wake Forest? Down to third string quarterback Santino Marucci made some magic happen at the buzzard to win 21 17. 15 yard touchdown pass with 15 seconds to go to cap off the 48 yard touchdown drive that came together in the final 40 seconds. So the Deeks now four and three, snapped a three game losing streak, and Pitt now falls to two and five on the season. UVA was down three against North Carolina, pulled off the shocker of the season. UNLV, ladies and gentlemen, is now six and one thanks to a comeback against Colorado State. South Florida erased an 11 point deficit against UConn. Northern Illinois was down three against Eastern Michigan and won 20 to 13. And ODU came back against App State to beat them 28 21. So just because you have a lead in the fourth quarter, do not quit playing. And if you're behind in the fourth quarter, don't give up. Because clearly, as evidenced by this past Saturday's outcomes, anything can happen there in the final 15 minutes of the game. I'm going to give you one quick bonus takeaway, too. The curse of being ranked number 10 is real. Our number 10, that is. It is real. We have now seen three teams in three consecutive weeks that were ranked number 10 in our rankings that have come up short. We've seen Washington State come up short. We most recently saw North Carolina come up short. I don't even remember who was the other team that was ranked in there. Coobs, you might be able to help me. I honestly, off the top of my head, just can't remember. So all I'm saying right now is if you are Oregon State, who is our top 10 team this year, this week, be careful <laughs> when traveling to Tucson to take on what is a really improved Arizona football team. I think it was Louisville that you had number 10 that also lost. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be really interested, Greg, in who you have at number 10, not this week so much, but next week. Because if I see LSU in that spot, I know what you're doing. And <laughs> I like it. If you think I'm going to put a two loss team over a bunch of one loss teams, then you are officially out of your mind. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. Want to give a couple shout outs before we got off the air here. With five weeks left in the regular season, there are 30 bowl eligible teams not including Jacksonville State and James Madison. So maybe you should listen to Wednesday's show. I might go on a rant. I might go on a rant on Wednesday's show because James Madison and Jack State both above the six-win mark, and they will not be going to the postseason as of right now. But want to give a shout-out to UNLV. They beat Colorado State 25-23. They're now 6-1 and one on the season, and the Rebels are now bowl-eligible for the first time since 20. 20- 
13. So shout out to Barry Odom and the job he's doing there in Vegas. And then Rutgers, Rutgers, they are going bowling. The Scarlet Knights are six and two. They hit the six win barrier for the first time since 2014 with the big win over Indiana. Now they needed it too, because if you see what's coming down the stretch for Rutgers, it's a doozy, man. You got Ohio State, Iowa, Penn State, Maryland on the dock at the rest of the way. So getting to six and two is massive for Greg Schiano and the Scarlet Knights. Thanks for being with us. We so appreciate all of you for listening to the show and consuming the show wherever you get it. We continue to ask you kindly, if you could, Subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Okay. It's on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe to the podcast. And if you could just take 30 seconds to leave us a rating, five stars would be much appreciated. But leave us a rating. That'd be awesome. Then if you could on Apple Podcasts, write us a review. We read those. It means a lot to us and it helps us better understand what you guys prefer when putting together this content on a week to week basis, tell your friends as well. And if you're on the ESPN YouTube channel, subscribe to the ESPN college football channel and hit that thumbs up button in the video right below. We so appreciate all of you for being a part of the journey here on always college football. And for all of us, for Mark, Jake, Jack, I'm Greg. Also shout out to the other Jack who's a diehard Ohio state fan. Glad that he could make it today after they win this past weekend. He hasn't been around much the last couple of weeks, but now that they're sitting undefeated and sitting in a really, really good spot, it's nice to know that he's going to be a part of the show moving forward. Thanks to Sharif. And thanks to Dylan as well. All of us, everybody that helps us here at Always College Football, we are eternally grateful for. For all of us here at Always College Football, we hope you have a tremendous day. Remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.